This is the story of my friend Kristen. Last year, Kristen moved from Austin to San Diego to be near family and start her life over. And just a few months later, she had that terrifying moment in the shower we all hope we never have. This podcast is about what happens when you have breast cancer, told in real time. Go back to last night. Yeah. What was on your mind last night when you went to bed? Oh, I know what was on my mind last night. My head has been hurting. Like my hair, like, you know, when you have a ponytail and it feels like it's pulling, Mm -hmm. that's what the crown of my head feels like right now. And that's, that's from the the chemo. My hair follicles are reacting. And so when I went to sleep last night, I was thinking, I just got this haircut. Is my hair already, already going to fall out? (laughs) That's really what I was thinking. (laughs) And it's interesting because I didn't even get my bag ready for today. And I guess I was either in denial I was having chemo or I was relaxed. I don't know which it was. So I knew what to expect, but I was nervous about my labs. Mm -hmm. Why do you think you were nervous about them? Well, earlier this week or last week, I had three infections and it's like strep C, like you always have that bacteria in your throat. Mm Mm-hmm. And then it was ear and then it was bladder. And so I was really upset this week because not from being sick and not from feeling bad, but as you know, being married to a teacher, our immune systems are like, I mean, like swine flu, you know, like nothing, nothing touches me. And so I've gone 20 years with this fantastic immune system where like, I'm not the girl who gets the flu or the colds, right? I get the migraine and the allergies or I tear something in my leg, whatever. I was going to say, you're the one in the boot. (laughs) I'm the one in the boot. That's right. Damn it. (laughs) So I don't get that stuff. And this week I got that stuff. And I was very disheartened Mm -hmm. that my immune system that has taken me through so much, it was so quickly depleted. And I guess I just kind of feel like I got to be careful because if my body's turning on me, (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know, what if something else is out there and and what does that do to me? And it's not really fear so much as it's concern. I don't know what to expect. So that's why I'm worried about my labs. My impression is that it sounds like you're just, it's more fear of the unknown Mm -hmm. and how quick it started. That was it for me. Yeah. So you got up in the dark this morning. Mm -hmm. What was it like outside? So when I woke up this morning, it was windy and rainy. And I had had weird dreams about trying to ride my bike. Don't ask me why to my appointment today. (laughs) And I'm like, okay. Obviously, I had some anxiety because right before I woke up, my dream was about not making it to my chemo. And they kept calling me and calling me and calling me. And I was lost and couldn't figure out how to get there. Mm -hmm. And when I was driving in today, I was thinking about how I had felt the week before and how I didn't have that feeling of, I don't want to go. It wasn't that I was looking forward to it. At least I had a little bit of an idea of what to expect. Okay. Tell me about your port. Where is it? Does it hurt? Is it uncomfortable? Yeah, it's like right next to my armpit. And they put it on the left because it's the right breast that has the tumor. Mm -hmm. And there's some reason for that. I don't know exactly what it is. So I've only had it in for about three weeks. So it's still healing. And so down here, as I touch it, it feels hard. And it's about the diameter of a quarter and the depth of two quarters stacked. I had this put in, it was vascular surgery. And then right here is a small little catheter that mm-hmm. goes into my carotid artery and then goes down here into my aorta. Wow. And what they do is they go in and they flush it. Yep. And it tastes like acetone. Whatever you think acetone would taste like, it Ew. tastes like acetone smells. I know it's very weird. The saline, the saline in here tastes like that. 
makes your mouth taste like something. That's so strange. I know. And so they put a an IV, I guess, basically in there. Yeah. And they flush it to be sure there's no blood clots or anything like that. And then they draw my labs from it. Mm-hmm. And then they put the tubes on for the infusion center to connect to. I'm just like walking around for hours with like tubes hanging out. I haven't gotten it out of my mind. Two weeks ago when I was in there for the first time, I said, how long is the port in? I said, do they like take it out when you have your breast surgery? And she said, well, actually a lot of people choose to leave it in because they feel like it's bad luck Ooh, if you take it out. That's interesting. I know. I was like, wow. And I was instructed very firmly by the vascular surgeon that no one is to touch this. So other people still take blood from you other ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it's so specialized and it's Mm -hmm. in such a prominent place in your body. Yeah. They don't want to mess it up. It took me a little while to be able to sleep on that side. It's still tender, but I was told today that it looks really good. It'll probably always be a little bit tender because it's not supposed to be there. So, Well, it's, yeah, it's a foreign object in your body. Yep. It's called a smart port. So it has some kind of smart technology. And I have a little card that I am supposed to carry around that tells people what it is and like a serial number and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Kind of like I'm chipped. And then <laughs> it has a walkie-talkie and you can, they can track you. Like they can turn on find my friends and find you. And yeah, and they can look at my, all my data. That's the port thing that was, I was shocked at how just casual they were about it. Yeah. Get your port put in. It's there to make everything go smoothly, you know? So, And it's also to preserve your other veins, because if you think of how much is going through there, if they're going to access these smaller veins, you're going to tear them and burn them out. So this is kind of a weird question, but when you look around during infusion, Does it look like everyone's ports are in on one side or the other in the same spot? Or do people have ports in other parts of their bodies? So the only time I really see anything about people's ports is when I'm in the port area. And there's like three chairs in there. And most people have it in their chest. I will say, I don't know if they still do this or not. But when my mom had chemo for ovarian cancer, now this was in the 90s. So it was a long time ago since the ovarian cancer was all in her reproductive area and a teensy bit on her diaphragm, the port was like in her pelvis. And Hmm. so the chemo went straight there and it didn't go into a vein. It just went straight into the abdominal cavity. Whoa. And so as a result of that, her digestive system was fried. Oh my God. Yeah. So I don't know that they do that anymore because that was actually a conversation that I had when they said they wanted to do chemo first. And I said, I was hoping to avoid chemo. And here's why. Oh, because you were remembering that. Mm -hmm. And so in chemo, I think most people probably have it somewhere up here because they want to access that big vein. Mm -hmm. And when I'm in the infusion center, I'm one of those antisocial people that pulls my curtain around and plus COVID. So I'm about six to seven feet apart from people. But I know the guy next to me today was getting a three-hour bag of chemo. And I was like, wow, I thought my 40 minutes, then hour, then 20 minutes was bad. Yeah, three hours is long. Yeah. So was there anything different today than the first time, or was it pretty much the same routine? No, today it was very similar. I was surprised at how long it took them to get my chemo bags. Because what they do first is they give you a two anti-nausea shots of medicine in your port. And then they give me a steroid that takes about 40 minutes. Mm-hmm. And that's to handle today. Did you drive yourself today? No, my friend Jerry no. took me. Okay. Yeah. My friends won't let me drive myself. That's good. Which is really nice. That's something that no one really told me, but I'm really glad because when you come out tired or just kind of feeling a little bit off and there's a friendly face there. It's awesome. So it sounds like you have a lot of people watching over you right now. Mm-hmm. What are you doing with yourself between chemos? You know, how are you filling in the holes? It's a good question. 
Well, you just saw me with my ice cream. Well, other than eating. <laughs> well, so I work. And there were a few times this past week and the week before, maybe four days where I was really tired. They're wonderful about it. And that really revitalizes me too. I mean, who doesn't want to play with a one-year-old? I do. (laughs) So I do that. When I come home, I take Jack for a long walk and that usually coincides with sunset. So that's really nice. We're up on a cliff. And so to go down, we have to zigzag probably about eight minutes. And that means I have to zigzag back up eight minutes. And so depending on my energy level, depends on if I zigzag, but we always go and we can watch it just on the bluff. And then I have a women's group that I'm a part of and we have Zoom meetings and we have the option to attend them every night if we want to. And then I'm really tired. Mm. So I'll take a little power nap and then just try to relax and kind of catch up from my day. I, I try to document each day how I'm feeling and what was going on that day so that I have a record of it. A few days ago, you cut off all your hair. I did. (laughs) (laughs) Where did you go? And what was that experience like? So I went uh, on Saturday and I was so excited. I had all these pictures and I kept sending them to people, which one, which one, which one? And Mm -hmm. each picture had like three votes. And I was like, well, that didn't help me. And so I had an idea. So I had texted her the ones that I thought would be good. And I was trying to find things that complemented my face because I have kind of a longer face and like an oval face. So when I got there, it was in one of those little suites. So there was no one, no one around really. Oh, and ironically, these suites were in the same exact location where I helped my dad open his grocery store in Del Mar 30 something years ago. Yeah. Yeah. In the Del Mar, swear. Wow. I know. So weird. It's called the Del Mar Plaza. And so 35 years ago, I helped my dad open that store and I was one of the managers there. You got 84 comments on your haircut photo on Facebook. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, people are. I don't think I've ever had that many. I know. Isn't that funny? 155 likes. Nine wows. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. Well, because I haven't put it out there. Some of those people know I have cancer and some of them don't. And so I'm trying to keep it not sad kind of an adventure. I think you're doing a great job of it. Nobody that doesn't know already isn't going to figure it out from this. So yes, when I went in, I was anxious to see like, not anxious, but excited to see where, where her studio was. And it was actually where the service deli was before. And I told her that and she was laughing, but it was the first time I'd been back to that center in 30 years. What a strange experience. Such a trip, such a trip. Cause that was a big event in my life to do that. And so I said, I just want something that I'm not going to freak out. It doesn't have to be super short, but I don't want to freak out with like a big swirl of hair next to me on the bed when I wake up or in the shower or something like that. And so she was so thorough. She sat and she was looked, she looked at my face and then she looked at my calyx and then she looked at my hairline and she's like, okay, I think I know what I want to do. I said, I totally trust you. I said, just do what you think. She didn't really warn me. All of a sudden, I feel this razor cut in the back. And I'm like, so I guess we're doing it. (laughs) And she was just so good. And what was really interesting is, you know how Brian and I look very much alike. Mm -hmm. And he has short hair. I had my glasses off. And I was like, like Brian, I was sitting there and I was like, I'm looking more and more like my son. That's kind of weird. And what was really, (laughs) what was really weird is when she showed me the back, I was like, I know that hairline. That's my son's hairline. And I have a mole right where he has a mole oh, back crazy. that I never knew about. It's not weird. But it was just the weirdest thing because it was like seeing myself only I hadn't because I've never really seen what my hairline looks like like that. So she did such a beautiful job. And I was very self-conscious about, you know, my eye wrinkles or like maybe my chin that's not completely taut or, you know, cause I always picture people who have short hair with these big, with these beautiful faces like Halle Berry. And I mean, I, I've never considered myself ugly, but I never thought, oh, I have this beautiful face that can totally pull off a bald head or short hair. And what was really 
incredible about it was I got more self-confidence after I did it. And I looked and I was like, oh, you can see my cheekbones, Mm -hmm. you know, and I, I wasn't hiding behind anything anymore. It's crazy. You look so much, you didn't look old before, but you look younger. Isn't that funny? Yeah. Yeah. I've had people say that. And it's interesting. One of the people on Facebook who doesn't know that I have cancer, she said it's something like, it's your personality exactly, fierce and feisty. And then people who I haven't talked to in years said things, you know, just really sweet. And I have to say, I love it. Um, And I may not go back. What was the name of the salon? Her name is Lael, L-A-E-L, Anne-Marie is the name. And she's in Del Mar. She's incredible. Can I tell you what my oncologist said today? Please. I was leaving and she said, is it as bad as you thought it was going to be? And I said, no. And she smiled, you know, and she said, because this is as bad as it's going to get. And I was like, what? And she said, yeah. She said, you're going to feel more fatigued. But the side effects that you had through the first chemo are going to be about the same through all of it. And I was so relieved. I was so relieved. It's not like this giant downhill progression until you're like on death's door. That's what I thought. Now, I think with the fatigue, it is. So I think where people get that is with their immune systems and getting sick. Mm -hmm. Because eventually it's going to be compromised completely and you're going to have to be careful. And the fatigue. I think those are the two things. But I told her, she asked about the symptoms. And I said, well, you didn't tell me to do this, but I did it. And she said, what? And I said, I tried to stay ahead of the symptoms, kind of like you do when you're on pain meds. And she said, she asked what I did. And I just told her when I got up, I took a Zofran. After eight hours, I took a Zofran. And then I took whatever the other anti-nausea is at night that makes you a little bit drowsy. For the bone pain, I took a Claritin, which is odd and weird to me, but it worked. Mm -hmm. But I kept the regimen going so that I didn't get sick. Did she say, oh, what a smart girl you are? Yeah, she said, that's awesome. Do it. Keep doing it. And so... I was relieved to hear that because I didn't have a lot of nausea, Mm -hmm. knock on wood. And I understood what the fatigue felt like. And I kind of know now to go to bed a little bit earlier and stuff. California's opened up again. Yeah, the nail salons are open. That's what I heard about today. So I'm going to have to be a little bit more careful. Yeah. Just put your bubble on. You'll be fine. I double mask now with the hospital I did. Say a little prayer that it is the same Mm -hmm. because that would be good. I'd like to be able to do as much of my normal stuff as I can. Yeah. The more normal stuff you can do, the better. It'll make the emotional stuff easier too. Yeah. Getting your nails done. I finally went after it. It had probably been years. It was like the greatest hour of my life. Right. It was just so luxurious. So I told myself I would never go that long again. I need to get a pedicure badly. And yeah. I think with the taxol, that doesn't happen until March. My, your nails are supposed to like get brown and kind of yucky. So mm. can you get a pedicure before then? Yes. I'm going this weekend. Definitely. Good. The last thing I just want you to tell me about before we go is a good friend of ours sent you something really special today. Do you want to just... Aww. My Talk about that for a second. So, wow. Yeah. So she told me to look for something. And she's basically like an ex-mother-in-law that's still my mom, who I adore. And she has had breast cancer twice. And both times she avoided having to have uh, massive surgery or chemo. She had radiation that solved it. So She's been really a cheerleader for me. And when I got home today and this bracelet from Brighton. It's like vintage Brighton. Yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah, 16 years old, 17 years old. Only the second version of a breast cancer thing that they did. And it has, it's a charm that has the breast cancer logo on it that is in the center of a heart that has little gems in the heart that move. And on the back of it, it says, this is the key. And you didn't know this, love heals. 
is what it says on the back. And she sent it to me and she has a matching one. The one that she sent me was the one she got for her mother to wear while she was going through it. And her mom wore it almost every day until she died. And I was very close to Grammy and was there when Grammy had her stroke and the family was out of town. And it was actually my ex at the time was there coming to the hospital to help. And it's so special to me because these are people I would have chosen as my family. And when I, I was texting with with her and she said, this is the biggest gift I can give you to help you heal. And it truly is. I was crying. I don't have things like this in my family. The traditions aren't there. It's just very different. And to have something like this, and it was actually the first thing that I ever, I have that actually had the breast cancer logo on it. And when I saw it, I was like, oh yeah, I have breast cancer. Huh. That's a symbol that belongs to you now. Mm-hmm. That didn't before. Mm-hmm. When's the last time you saw her? Before I moved, probably yeah. 13, 14 months ago. Yep. And I know that this is the last thing she wanted to have to give me. I know. And so when she did, it was both of our ways of knowing that it's okay. It's going to be okay. And she helped me to understand how to tell the girls about it too. Mm -hmm. And it was a good experience, you know, and they had a good reference point because their grandmother has recovered from breast cancer twice. So they didn't have the experience of someone they love dying. One of them was very excited about my haircut and (laughs) wants me to get exciting colored wigs and have a whole new look. And the other one was devastated, which I was surprised about. And she put a breast cancer fundraiser on Facebook for her birthday, which I thought was lovely. And it brought us closer because she got to really talk about some feelings that she had. And it was good. You never know how you're going to tell kids that you have cancer, but I made sure that I wasn't texting them, that I was talking with them. So what my hope is, like I'm doing with my nieces, I hope that they both see that there's strength and grace in illness and that it's yours to make of it what you want within reason. Because what I feel like is I feel like everything's taken care of. You know, I'm not wealthy. I have enough money to live on, but I have good insurance. The doctors are doing their thing. My support group is intact. I just got to go. And I just got to stay well. That's it. You know, and if I do those things, chances are you've got another 30 years. I can't wait to see what you do after this. Right? I can't either. (laughs) You know what I bought? And I know you would totally love this. It's coming from England. It's really pretty. It's a huge 2021 wall calendar with every day of 2021 on it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm color coding like, colored transparent dots for different things. And as I move through, I'm marking off in like my own little pretty way or how far I've gone. And I'm trying to make it like a, a living journal. And that way I can see what's going on. And I'm visual. It's the teacher in me too. Yeah, for sure. Do you need some colored dots? I do. I need some, are they transparent? <laughs> gold, gold, I think, stars. I, <laughs> gold stars. The gold stars will be my chemo days. On chemo days, I have like a special dinner and a special treat that are waiting for me. Darn right. Yeah. I love you. I love you too. Thank you for telling your story part two. Thanks for listening to Breast Cancer Stories. To support Kristen, you can find us at patreon.com slash Stories. There's a link in the show notes with all of the resources mentioned on this episode and more info about how you can donate. If you're facing a breast cancer diagnosis and you want to tell your story on the podcast, send an email to hello at theaxis.io. I'm Eva Shea, your host and executive producer. Production support for the show comes from Mary Ellen Clarkson, and our engineer is Daniel Cruiser. Breast Cancer Stories is a production of The Axis. 
T-H-E-A-X-I-S dot I-O.